When at the beginning of September, Napoleon rejoined Josephine at X for the triumphal progress up the Rhine, Madame de Baudet was a prominent figure at all the festivities and undertook to amuse the conqueror. On returning to Paris, she felt sufficient confidence in her own position to brave the wrath of the empress, whose jealousy had been roused. She accumulated debts as lavishly as Josephine herself and set up the establishment of an acknowledged favorite in the pretty little Chateau de la Tuileries afterwards, the abode of Rachel and of tears, and now the convent of the Assumption. She was the center of a brilliant circle, gave magnificent receptions, and lived in almost regal state. After a long interview with Napoleon, she laid a statement of her debts before him for the first time. They were promptly paid. On a second occasion, she was equally successful. On a third, Napoleon bluntly refused the interview she requested. I am neither rich enough nor good-natured enough, he said, to pay so dearly for what I can get so cheaply. Thank Madame de Vaudet for her kindness to me, and let me hear no more of her. Hereupon followed a pathetic letter from the lady who vowed she would poison herself if her debts... Debts of honor were not paid in 24 hours. The aide-de-camp on duty was dispatched to a toy where he found her not at all bent on self-destruction. She was requested to resign her post immediately, and her name consequently does not appear in any of the imperial almanacs. At a later period, when her brain seems to have been somewhat affected, she went to Monsieur Napoleon and urged him to murder Napoleon. Reduced to poverty, almost blind and paralyzed in one arm, she hawked about her souvenirs of the directory of the empire, mainly as an excuse for begging. She it was who furnished the publisher, Ladvukat, with those memoirs of a lady in waiting, which served as padding for his edition of Constance's memoirs. The best that can be said of her is that she was poverty stricken and half crazed. Others had not even this excuse. It was Josephine who introduced Madame de Vaudet to court at the instance of Le Couture. She had a swarm of protégés of the same and of an inferior order whose social sponsors are persons even less considerable and whose only claim to a place at court seems to have been their readiness to amuse the master. In all this, however, there was no premeditation on Josephine's part and the idea that she had become so far resigned as to provide distractions for her husband rests on a radical misconception of her character in her creole temperament there was a singular inclination to surround herself with dependents drawn from a sort of debatable land between the world of gentility and that of domestic service young women whose pretty faces were pleasant to look at who amused her by their lively prattle entertained her with their accomplishments and gave a certain gaiety and animation to that palace dreary as greatness out of which she never set foot she engaged them without much inquiry as to their antecedents moved by some tale of woe or attracted by some figure a piquant expression an unexpected answer of these young people many had known adventures all were bent on conquests poor and unscrupulous they and their meager little toilettes were suddenly introduced to the most elegant court in the world they had no regular their occupation and shut up in idleness in the private apartments of the empress they had nothing to do but to flirt with the brilliant officers whom they dreamt of as possible husbands for had not many no better than themselves married generals who were now marshals of the empire he who was the fountain of honors who could make or mar fortunes by a sign passed in and out familiarly among them at all hours they lay in wait for him longing for such a sign ready to risk all for attainment some among them had little enough to risk and as they showed their complacence thus plainly as they were always in evidence and always eager to please as the Emperor's subordinates were always on the watch like the valets in a comedy to see whether the master showed a preference. A bargain was readily concluded and things followed their inevitable course without the least attempt at seduction on the one hand or a pretense of love on the other. However secretly such an intrigue was conducted, Josephine invariably discovered it sooner or later. There were 
It would be a stormy scene. The young woman would be dismissed, generally with a substantial dowry, which enabled her to make an excellent match with some not-too-rigid gentleman and a rear family of the first distinction. Among the bevy was the Cité Congrat the daughter of one of the ushers of the council, whom Josephine had engaged to announce the imperial entry in readiness for this office. She sat all day in an anteroom leading to the private apartments, her only duty being to throw open the doors before the emperor and empress. Her salary for this office was 3,600 francs a year. And in 1806, Josephine increased the sum by 600 francs. But Fisité Langrois was an unimportant personage. Scarcely more than a servant. Mademoiselle Lacoste was rather above this level. She was a pretty blonde, somewhat too thin, but with a graceless figure and a refined and intelligent face, she was an orphan without a penny, brought up by an aunt who was an adept in stratagems and who indeed brought about her introduction to Josephine by a series of ingenuous contrivances the empress received her kindly and bestowed on her the somewhat vague title of reader. No very severe tax was made upon her in this capacity for immediately after her nomination, the court left Milan, where the coronation was to take place. Mademoiselle Lacoste followed the court without, as it were, belonging to it as reader. She was not associated with the suite, nor could she fraternize with the ladies' maids, next to whom she lodged in solitude, much oppressed with the loneliness of her new life. At stupidness. The emperor glanced at her at Milan. He remarked her. A subsequent negotiation was neither difficult nor prolonged, but Josephine discovered that it was concluded. A terrible scene followed. The reader was dismissed. Her aunt was summoned from Paris to take her away. Before her departure, however, the empress stipulated that she should appear once at the empress's reception. Here was a fresh scandal, for it was against etiquette for a reader to be seen outside the private apartments. Josephine had nevertheless to yield. After his return to Paris, Napoleon arranged a marriage for Mademoiselle Lacoste. She became the wife of a rich financier, proved an excellent wife and mother, and was seen no more to Tuileries at Genoa. During the same Italian tour, on the occasion of the festivities held to celebrate the union of the Ligurian Republic with France, a certain Madame Gazzini, or Gazzana, was designedly thrown in the emperor's way. Her maiden name was Bertani. And she was the daughter, some say of a singer, others of a dancer at the Grand Theater. She had been summoned to Milan as one of the very mixed company which received Josephine. That company in which side by side the great ladies of the Negron, Brignol, Doria, and Remy D families was to be found. That Bianchina left flesh, for whom was reserved such a brilliant career in Westphalia, Carlotta Gazzini was tall, somewhat too slight for perfect beauty, but very gracefully formed, saved out of her feet and hands. They were ugly. A defect she concealed to some extent by never appearing without gloves. Her face was exquisite, a perfect type of Italian beauty in its absolute purity of outline. Her dark eyes were large and beautiful, and the delicate harmony of her features was enhanced by an arch smile that displayed the most beautiful teeth. Every woman who saw her praised her loveliness, a proof that she was unquestionably beautiful, but that she lacked the supreme charm that rouses the envy of other women. Monsieur Ramuzat, the Grand Chamberlain, was Madame Cassini's social sponsor. He persuaded the emperor to make her one of the empress's readers. We quote from Madame Remus saw herself. It seems the tavern was not alone in having his pockets always full of mistresses, as Napoleon said, Madame Gazzini, who was usually styled Gazzini Brentano, and who at a later period took the title of Baron de Brentano. On what grounds? We know not. Accordingly, became reader in the place of Mademoiselle Lacoste at a salary of 500 francs a month. From 1805 to 1807, little was heard of her. The emperor was constantly on the march. Austerlitz was followed up by the Prussian and Polish campaigns. After his return, she began to marshal her forces, first at Paris, afterwards at France, and blew 6,000 francs. was not exactly the income she considered adequate to meet her own expenditure. And 
advance her husband's interests and give her daughter such a dowry as to enable her to make a brilliant marriage. Her opportunity came and she seized it. She was so lodged that she could answer summons from the emperor in any house. And when such a summons came, she responded with alacrity. She showed no arrogance, however, never posed as a favorite, and accepted her equivocal honors with due humility. The empress, whose jealousy had been roused at first, was reassured when Napoleon himself confided the whole history of his ephemeral weakness to her. Towards Josephine, Madame Gazzini's attitude was uniformly respectful and submissive. She kept in her proper place and was perfectly unpretentious. She was accorded the privilege of joining. The imperial circle was admitted to the society of the Empress's suite. With this exception, however, Napoleon showed her no particular attention in public. He allowed the ladies in waiting to treat her as they pleased. The liberty they took advantage of to isolate her on all possible occasions, withdrawing from the corners in which she seated herself and pointedly ignoring her presence. The state of affairs was not of long duration in time many, and these not the least haughty of the band relented. Ever see Madame Gazzini into their midst, she had obtained something more substantial than court honors, namely her husband's appointment as receiver general for Evra. After the divorce, she joined him there, and being within easy distance of Navarre, where Josephine was living, she became one of the intimates of her house. Her chief bond of union with Navarre was her liaison with one of the Empress's equerries, Monsieur de Portal, who contributed largely to her expenditure until his marriage with Mademoiselle de Castellan. After the Fontainebleau episode, the Emperor never met her, but by chance, he never professed any love for her and seems scarcely to have mentioned her name in after years. Madame Gassani was not inconsolable. Her daughter, Charlotte Josephine Eugenie Claire, styled Baron de Brentano, married Monsieur Alfred Musselman, by whom she had a daughter who became the wife of Monsieur Eugène Leon. On the other hand, Napoleon frequently recalled a certain Mademoiselle Guibault, the daughter, it was said, of an unsuccessful banker who in 1808 was appointed to share Madame Cassini's duties as reader. Madame Guibault, her mother, an Irish woman by birth, had three daughters, two of whom had been trained to dance in drawing rooms, playing tambourines, and striking attitudes. The eldest was taken up by Princess Eliza, who married her very well, and the younger of the two, whom, said scandal, neither Murat nor Junot had found inflexible, managed to attract the notice of Queen Ortas, who was fascinated by her pretty face and graceful dancing at a masked ball given by the Princess Caroline at the Elysee Ortas, who was to lead a quadri of vestals, took it into her head to dress Mademoiselle Guibault as folly and to make her head the procession tambourine in hand. Caroline, who had double cause of jealousy, rushed forward as soon as she recognized her rival after a stormy scene between the sisters-in-laws, the obnoxious folly was finally ejected.